I'm Mima Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Paul Harding, I am so happy to see your face right now. I am so happy to see you. This Other Eden is finally here. I have been waiting for this novel, and it is a miracle and a wonder and all of the things you want a novel to be. And it's 220 pages, which we have to talk about that. But thank you for being here. I'm so excited to see you. Where did this book come from? Where did this other Eden start for you? Oh, my gosh. Oh, it goes back a long <laughs> way. <laughs> First of all, thank you for having me. It's a great, great pleasure to be be talking with you. Um, it's so funny because, you you know, now you get to the point where it's about to be published. And then people start asking, well, where did it start? And it's interesting because every time I try to do a novel, it really just starts with all, like, all the reading I'm doing, the music I'm listening to, the paintings I'm looking at, you know, all the different things. I, I just throw it all into the cauldron, you know, and then you start to get these little constellated kind of points where you think, oh, that's interesting. And that's interesting. And you start just kind of permutating and seeing. So there are different elements So when I actually started saying, you know, it's like I got to sit down and start trying to, you know, kind of invoke a novel. I, um, I just started off actually with um, just some scenes that were set in one of the same uh, locations as my second book, Enon, big estate in Massachusetts. And um, one of the minor characters from Enon, who in Enon is like 90 years old or mm -hmm. something. I'm just going to plunk her down in the meadow of her family's, you know, you know, property and just start riffing on her when she was like 10 years old. And I, and I actually had this idea that she had the sense of having had a sibling or something, mm -hmm. like a ghost sibling or something. And I, I knew it wouldn't be the, the book. But I just started riffing and trying to invoke kind of this world and this, you know, this. And then I, this is just, this is so specific, it seems strange, but I'm always looking at paintings. I'm uh, kind of a junkie for um, landscape and for still life paintings. Okay. I was reading about this um, painter, who's a black painter in the 19th century. I think he was at, from Connecticut or he studied in Connecticut. His uh -huh. name is Charles Ethan Porter. And as I'm writing these scenes in the meadow in Enon, I come upon this incredible painting that he did of haystacks, of hay mowing. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, I'm like, hey, it's early. I can do anything I want. So I just put a guy out in the meadow behind where the characters were talking out painting, you know, and somebody mm -hmm. says, who's that guy? So, you know, I just, you know, kind of, here we go, just, just sort of improvising, kind of riffing. And then uh, I was, oddly enough, by coincidence, was reading a history of organized labor in the United States. <laughs> okay. A okay. After the Civil War, as one does. One of the things that interested me was that how labor unions were one of the earliest kind of American U.S. institutions that actually were um, integrated, were integrated and advocated for women's suffrage. And, you know, because when you have working folks live together. They tend to live together, right? And so just how you keep, you know, the sort of communities at peace and that sort of thing. So I just started wondering about either all Black or racially integrated right. communities after the Civil War. I'm like, there must have been, you know, people get together, right? You know, so I just did the Google thing, <laughs> just like integrated communities after the Civil War, you know, very, very sort of straightforward. And, you know, within two or three um, results, came across this story, the historically factual story of um, a place called Malaga Island, which mm -hmm. is off the a small island off the off the um, coast of southern Maine um, that from about 1792 or 1793 until 1912 was the site of a um, racially integrated community, small fishing community. And I thought, ooh, Maine, because my first novel, Tinkers, was set in Maine, and my grandparents were from Maine, so that's kind of in the cellular level. And then what I found out was that some of the people, so in 1912, the state of Maine evicted the people from the right. settlement. And one of the things I found out was that um, some of the people were compelled to go to a place called the Maine School for the Feeble-Minded. Mm -hmm. so you can imagine the delights that awaited. Um and that was the same place that one of the characters in my first novel, Tinkers, was going to be, you know, yep. this modeled after the same sort of place. So I start, you know, you're always looking, for, you know, you're like walking around with your, you know, your dowsing rod going, give me a sign. And things start to twitch. So I was like, Maine, the school for the feeble minded. And then by chance, I discovered that I, I think to the month that the, these people were um, uh, evicted from 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 the island, um, the first International Congress for Eugenics was taking place in London. 
And so I was just like, that's, you know, <laughs> you know, lemon, 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 jackpot. All at once, I realized the guy that's out mm-hmm. in the field painting is from that island. Right. Right. And then, you know, then it's just sentence by sentence trying to discover how everything comes together. And it really does. You open with a flood of biblical Absolutely. portions. And it is some of the most extraordinary writing I have seen in a while. And it was, I don't want to spoil it for people because it is, I I went back and read it a second time before oh, I good. kept moving through the book because I was just like, did he <laughs> just do what I think he just did? And I went to college in Maine. My family has some ties in Southern Maine as well. So, I mean, but I don't think of communities of color when I think of Maine, no, to be perfectly I, yeah. honest. And, mm-hmm. you know, now there's a Somali community up, yeah, right. you know, up north and whatnot. But traditionally, Maine, not really all that integrated. So, mm-hmm. I mean, right there, that got my attention, too. And then what you do with language and this, the members of this community, <laughs> I love. The women especially. I mean, the dudes are great, but the women are really kind of standing yep. So can we talk about the cast? I mean, we've got this very well-intentioned teacher slash minister in 1912, but let's let's start with the community before we, we go to him. Yeah, well, so one of the things that, you know, as I was thinking about that, I didn't want to write a, an historical novel. Right. I didn't want the novel was not going to be about Malaga Island, you know, for all sorts of different the descendants are up there and all the kind of stuff. But at the same time, it's it's it's, that, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, public domain. It's U.S. history. You know, it this happened and it only happened there, but it happened in all sorts of other communities. So it seems it seems something essential, you know, and essentially American, but also essentially the idea of the flood from the Bible on it, displacement, human displacement. Mm-hmm. So what I knew, and again, it's almost like with Tinker's, like all the load bearing dramatic premises of Tinker's were factual, right? But, and it's kind of the same with this book, but you could fit them on one side of a three by five index card, right? And so I just knew that this, that this settlement was founded by a guy, it, 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 the, the real person's name is was Benjamin Darling. It's tough not to use that name. It was such a great name. Benjamin Darling and his wife, Patience, I think her name was. I, it's Patience in the book. I can't, you know. And she was from Galway, from, from Ireland. And I just thought about just this couple, you know, just this, yep. you know, this, this couple who came there and they were, you know, uh, in, in, in a mixed marriage, as it were, you know, and, and just, you know, what it must have been like for just two people, you know, that sort of thing. And I was already imagining it. I was already like, mm-hmm. I didn't research anymore. I think I maybe read three or four articles about this. But then I wanted to populate the island. I didn't want to have too huge of a cast of characters, but I wanted a pretty robust, you know, I just wanted different pe- people and different descendants. I write about actually several generations after right. who would have been Benjamin and Patience. And so these are the kind of the last folks that are there. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're all, they're all descendants. And, and I don't know. And you know what you say about, you know, about the, the women, one of the things, and again, this is just, it's so concrete in so many ways. It's, one of my absolute favorite novels of all time, and I think it's just like this neglected American masterpiece, mm-hmm. is Sarah Orne Jewett's book called *The Country of the Pointed yep. Fur*, and it's all all it's all women. It's basically all women because all, the only men are just like these old, kind of decrepit sea captains, sort of. And the women are just like just these just just the characters in that book and what she does in that book. And I had and some of these things are just, so personal, it's just so weird, but. One of the things that drove me crazy about my first novel, Tinkers, is that there's a there's a character in there. She's the the mother of the family, and the two, and she does it. She does a very difficult thing in the book, and some people find her to be cold hearted and sort of. And I said, if you met the woman she was based on, you'd realize my character is much nicer than the beta. But I couldn't ever quite get her right. I, I couldn't quite do the justice to her that I really wanted to. I just thought of that, and so. For me, at the, at, the, at the beginning of the process, and I think maybe still through, there's a character named Esther. Esther who I love. Honey, love. who I thought of as kind of the epicenter of the novel. She absolutely is. She absolutely, she is straight out of New England mythology. Is she, I, I, and I say this as someone who, you know, has lots and lots of New England women standing behind her. And 
<laughs> yeah, Esther, she's awesome. <laughs> yeah, she's awesome. She's, she's like, awesome. She's, like, she's, she's, the, awesome. she's like the cranky Yankee, as they call it, you know, that sort yep. of thing. And I just knew that she was just, yeah, I just knew that she was a badass. You know what I mean? Yeah, completely. And one of the things, and again, I get the way I get my prompts visually or, you know, from music, et cetera. One of the things is that with these articles about Malaga Island is there are photographs of the of some of the families that were there in 1912. And I don't know why they were taken, but that's one of the first things I always think of is there's a woman sitting there. And she's got one of her grandchildren apparently in her lap. And I always just immediately get behind her shoulders and think, who is she looking at? Who's taking her picture? That sort of thing. And she has this very sort of suspicious, you know, just she's not very happy to be having it. And so, again, it would just be, you know, I just put this character in the rocking chair and just, you know, kind of just say, who are you? And just it's, the writer's job is to just like I think of it like literally like a manhole, like a trap door. I take the ladder down into the world and my job is just to shut up, be quiet and look and listen and take dictation. You know, don't, you don't know anything. You presume nothing. Uh, and so again, kind of one by one, these characters elaborated themselves. And there's a guy that ended up being, he's a civil war veteran. He's black. He served him with a Connecticut um, yep. black regiment in Connecticut. And I just, you know, I love these, old kind of new england name so i came his name is his name is zachary hand to god proverbs and I, you know i just thought was, you know he lives in a tree and he carves stuff in the tree you know just kind of one by one the characters can and then they started interacting with each other and so you finally kind of have this group of people yeah the island itself though is one of those characters and everyone's home yeah. which obviously is you know the sisters you were mentioning earlier they live in a converted ship's cabin yeah, <laughs> that somehow has been stripped. And I'm like, I'm trying to figure out the math of this. I'm like, I don't even know how you do that. But their home on this island is a converted ship's cabin. And uh, that may be that may I may have gotten that from the the history of Malaga. I think they're might, OK. I, I don't think that's unusual because you have these people that are, you know, they're pretty impoverished. Right. And so you do you wouldn't you wouldn't, you know, let a good cabin go to waste. Just because it wasn't on the water, I think, you know. No, there's absolutely that. And and Matthew Diamond, you know, this teacher slash minister slash, I guess he's a minister, yeah? Sort of missionary. I missionary, think yeah, yeah. Professional so minister. he's, you know, entirely well-intentioned in teaching these children, but also doesn't want them anywhere near him because they have lice. <laughs> and, you know, he's just sort of implying that they're all dirty. But, I mean, they're poor. It's 1912. No one's, yeah. you know, it's what it is. But his role, he's well-intentioned to a point, but he's incredibly, impossibly disruptive. I think everyone has encountered someone like this at some point in their lives where it's just like, you mean well. I understand that you mean well. Can we talk about eugenics and shutting down this community his introduction into the community it was, he is self-motivated as it were but mm -hmm. it, it it causes a rupture it causes mm -hmm. a rupture in the integrity of the of, of this place and that's kind of one of some of the earliest things that i had where you know this character esther just seeing this guy and just know just knowing just in the most general mm -hmm. way when people from the so-called mainland take notice of us it, nothing good is bound to come mm -mm. of it, mm -mm. you know? Um, and so I think he's, you know, yeah, he, it's, it's, it's that idea of just that, you know, the best of intentions, good intentions are often can be catastrophic. He's a combination of better and worse impulses. Right. You know, right. He's, he's, he's prejudiced, but he's aware of it. And he, he laments the fact that he is. And I thought that was kind of interesting, like, like an interesting complication. And, so I, that part of his character, um, I took from, a, I, I'm, I'm a, in my spare time, spare time, I'm a, I'm like a theology nerd. I read tons okay. and tons of theology. I read Karl Barth and his Swiss theologian. And like every good Swiss theologian, he's got a, you know, 15 volume church yep. dogma. And those things really are the model, models of close reading. You know, they're, they're close readings of the Bible and they're, and I love them because they're metaphysical. It's cosmology, all this sort of stuff. And he was one of the founding members of what was called the Confessing Church in World War II. And they were one of the only institutions to kind of like openly defy Hitler and to help Jews when nobody else was helping. You know, he did something when nobody else was doing anything. And after 20 years of reading him and thousands of pages of what, you know, 
Um, just one day I just happened to come across and just this little volume of correspondence. He just offhandedly says, he's talking about his son and he, the, who he says, you know, I'm my son, I'm, I'm just very glad that my son is not afflicted with, um, with what I suffer, which is, which is the visceral disgust I feel whenever I'm in the presence of a living Jew. I mean, it was so wretched and, 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 and but yet then here's all this other work he did and he did do. And you can't, you, you, they don't cancel each other. I, you know, like, it's true that he right. said that and felt that. And it's true that he also did those good. And that, you know, for a, for a writer, I mean, that's, or for an artist, you know, two opposite things, you put them right next to each other and you don't tell the reader what to think about them. That's what generates character, tension, complexity, and richness. Um, and so I just gave him that almost, you know, line for line, that par- a paraphrase of that about, about the mixed race folk, folks on the, on the island. Diamond is our connection back to Enon in a way because of something mm-hmm. he does. And and I'm going to let readers find out what that thing is because it's a great moment. I gasped a little bit when I saw Enon mention because I was trying to figure out somehow I knew this stuff was going to loop back. You don't walk away from New England. We would all like to walk away from New England. Some <laughs> people stay, some of us leave, whatever. Right. But like right. it gets under your skin. You don't leave. It's a place you never actually leave. It's true. You could move to California. Yeah, and the I, reason you would be in California is because of New England. Have you ever been to the Huntington Museum in California? In Pasadena? No, no. Okay. So one of the buildings they have, I spend quite a lot of time in California. And One of the buildings they have is full of all of this art that you and I have seen a thousand times over in all of those tiny museums throughout New England of those very staunch, stern looking. And I'm just like, I can't even, I'm 3,000 miles away and I still can't. can't, You can run, but you can't hide. All of those creepy flat paintings of children that if they come alive, you know those paintings are going to murder you in your sleep. And it's it's across the hall from the bathroom and you're just like, I would like to not die. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All of that stuff. Yeah, and it's it, true, but yeah. New England is this kind of place. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's I'm just like provincial by disposition, but also by choice. You know, I just mm-hmm. love it. There's just something. I mean, I just grew up, you know, kind of a miserable young kid. You know, <laughs> you know, like well, you know, I just didn't, you know, sort of felt tyrannized by school and by the way that you know what you were made to do and that sort of thing. And so I just, you know, be out in the woods up on the North Shore of Boston. Right. And I just, you know, even today, I, you know, some, often enough, I just say what I'm trying to kind of get down on paper is the you know, psychic and emotional experience that it has this visual correlation in being in like bare, cold New England woods like on a November afternoon at about 4.30. And that light, and it's just so beautiful, but so kind of stark. And forlorn and just, you know, it's just, like I said, it's, it's just on a cellular level. And the smell. I'm a bookseller. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but that smell, like, you know it when you smell it. You yeah, know, exactly. Yeah. And the light in the sky. Is, all of it. Especially if you're near the shore, if you're near yep. the water, the Atlantic is kind of like up in the sky. And all of these people are, are a product of that place and that very, very hard to live place, except yeah. for Matthew. Yeah. And he's saying, well, I think I have an out and he has an out for one of the boys. Right. Because he yep. passes for white. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the most striking things, too, about the, mm-hmm. those photographs I saw in that first the first time I encountered Malaga. Or it was actually a it's a picture of that. There's a school on the island, which yep. was actually highly enough regarded so that there were actually some students who came from other parts of Maine, you know, mm-hmm. other communities nearby yeah. communities, and paid a small tuition because it was, you know, so I wanted this guy to be legit i wanted to be intelligent i wanted to be, mm-hmm. be a good soul you know but the photograph there are photographs that, ex- that exist of all the kids who were on the island who went to the school and they really do you know like they present as everything from you know like blonde hair blue eyed to african you know just mm, yeah. and so he knows that there you know that, that the settlement is under duress it's coming under right. attention that is not going to you know uh, that doesn't bode well for it and so he thinks, regardless of what's going to happen, maybe one thing he can do is save this right. one young guy, this kid named Ethan, who is um, a good painter. He's, he's mm-hmm. he has an aptitude for painting and drawing. He basically contrives to have him taken from the island, you know, and he finds an opportunity for him to, he thinks, to practice his art um, off the island. Um, and he's in, he's, I mean, one of the things about you know, writing about these sorts of things is, is to just be very, very, very 
upfront, clear, straightforward. He knows that what, even doing that is a deeply morally ambiguous, you know, he's ambivalent. And that, you know, one of the things I'm always fascinated about when I teach the Old Testament, when I teach Shakespeare, I think, is the idea of measure for measure. And we don't know the value of what we're looking at, and especially for anything that's really meaningful or consequential. So he doesn't know if what he's doing is is a good a good gesture, or is it you know is it the least worst thing he can do, or is it catastrophic? Well, and also he has all the power in this situation. That, I mean, yeah. and right there, I mean, yeah, you write about a lot of characters who don't always have power. Yeah, and not absolutely. just in this book. I mean, this is right. this is part of what I think of when I think of your novels, and you know, Matthew is how we get to Enon, and I, you know. I had a moment where I was just like, okay, here's the connect. Okay, okay, yeah. I got this. <laughs> but the idea that you're settling into this world where Tinkers and Enon and this other Eden all sort of exist on a timeline mm -hmm. is why it's not something that frequently happens in literary fiction. And it's it's world building of a sort that isn't oh. just the houses and the people and the places and the light and the smell and everything else. It is the way you use language. And I feel like I can't talk to you without talking about revision because it's clear that, and you've talked about this in other interviews where you're like, yeah, yeah, I wrote stuff on the back of receipts and then there were post-it notes. And <laughs> I, I, I live I'm surrounded and die by, by them as we speak. Yeah, I live and die by post-it notes. I mean, we have an entire upcoming season of the show that's mapped out on post-it notes and galleys on my desk. Right, right. Yeah, there you go. I, <laughs> I, yeah. I cast no aspersions on anyone else's use of post-it yeah. notes. Yeah. But I love the idea that you are working from these very sort of tight, specific moments, and then you figure out where they connect, that you're not right. sitting down and saying, here's the world, and this is what's going to happen. It's yeah. more like, I have an image, I don't yeah. know where it's going yet. And you talked about this at the top of the show, but I love that idea because there's so much in each of the three novels where you're like, yeah, that. I, where did that come from? I don't know if it's, you know, in a former life as a drummer in a rock yeah. band, you know, and so when you're the drummer, mm -hmm. you keep time, right? Yep. The idea, you know, when I sit down at the drums, it's improvisational and you start looking mm -hmm. around and listening around and feeling around. And that's just what I do. But instead of doing it with a pair of sticks, you know, you do it with language. Right. You know? I just, I'm just endlessly obsessed with language and like, mm -hmm. we don't even know what language is, right? You know what I mean? It's just mm -hmm. like, it's so essentially human and so mysterious you know one of the things that i just feel more and more strongly about is that like meaning with a big m symbol with a capital yeah. s that stuff kind of takes care of itself mm -hmm. uh, you know like if you the writer are just taking care of the bricks and the mortar you know and just making sure every sentence you know says what it means and means what it says mm -hmm. and it means what it means literally right it means something literal and then as all of these literal sentences start to st start to, you know, you turn into paragraphs and pages and that sort of mm -hmm. thing, then figurative meaning starts to kind of almost vibrate and kind of precipitate off right. that. I love it because I've come upon I've come upon a way that works for me where I can have this process of just like mm -hmm. I'm just taking care of sentence by sentence, word by word and everything. And it just feels like as Melville called writing Moby Dick ditcher's work, It's just like, well, get the shovel and just like, you know. But then what starts to happen is after a week or whatever, you pull back and you look at the five mm -hmm. pages and you think, whoa, that's way better than what I had in mind. Right. You, you know, the idea that the language is smarter than you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and words have me, you know, I um, I have two full volume sets of the OED, the Oxford mm -hmm. English Dictionary, the newer one and then the older one. Right. And I just spend a part of every day spelunking through the language and reading the quotes and how every any given word has bet how its meaning has canted around, you know, through mm -hmm. the centuries. Um, so and just common words. I don't look up exotic words. Right. Um, and just, you know, so just that milieu, so that then again, you, if you're just doing that uh, without being very deliberate or goal oriented about it, I think mm -hmm. that ends up coming through in the language in in the novels. You know, there's just a sense of I don't know, deeper time. I want the characters to be super intimate and super like you know them, but at the same time, like, you know, they're as old as Moses and they're as recent as, you know, you see your neighbor when you go get the mail kind of thing. Isn't that the purpose of the novel, though? Honestly, yeah. is you're capturing time, right? 
A novel allows you intimacy with characters and their inner lives that no other medium does. Right. I think that's I true. I mean, film and television, they're great. They serve their purpose, all yep. props. Yep. But at the same time, you don't have the freedom to roam the right. way you do on the page. Like, yep. you've just got to deliver the thing and everything has to move forward. And it, da, 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 it, yep. it's very, very structured. Whereas one of the things I really appreciate about this other Eden and certainly with Tinker, I, Tinker's flows a little more and plays a little more with time the way this other Eden does. You know, and obviously when you're dealing with the death of a child, it's a different kind of reading yeah. experience. And that's a monologue too. Yeah. So and it's, it is, yeah. it is, you know, I mean, Charlie, Oh, poor Charlie. <laughs> what did I, poor, I like well, poor Charlie. Can, that's a whole other him. conversation, but yeah. poor Charlie, but poor guy. the way, the way Tinker's and, and this other Eden sort of sit, in this universe that is nonlinear, mm, um, absolutely. that is image driven, and and yep. even the way the characters interact, like Esther and her son Iha. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I love them. I, I, I mean, yeah, what a great character! But at the same time, I, you know, there's so much happening at this kind of simmer for everyone in yeah. this other Eden. And, and you know, Esther knows more than some of the other people in the community, without a doubt. Oh, yeah. And yeah. certainly I, I loved her more for not trusting <clears throat> Matthew. <Jones. laughs> yes, he is well-intentioned, but, I mean, immediately her eyebrows up and she's like, she's mm. like oh, 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 oh. That's one of those interesting, you know, one of the interesting kind of um, antitheses that sort of came mm -hmm. up. And again, this is, these are things you just discover. And, like, me saying this isn't like, oh, now you've got the skeleton. Right, just, right. What I try to do is everything's just out there in the open. Like mm -hmm. the meaning starts when you know what's happening, as opposed to you know the way that we're taught to read and sometimes taught to write, which is that no sentence means what it says; it stands for something else. Like my one of my absolute hard and fast rules is every sentence means exactly what it says. You know, but uh, you know Matthew Diamond and the Mainlanders, the white uh, quote unquote, you know, the mm -hmm. white character, you know, they their term is pure white because that would be eugenics, right? And the Islanders and Esther and the women in her family, the generations for them, it's plain white. Right. You know, and that, and she's just, you know, so she just knows that, you know, just like her, Something's you know, the hackles raise. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I think that's, that goes back to, and again, it's just a personal thing. I like, I want to write, you know, you said the book is like 220 pages long. Mm -hmm. I want it to be a thousand pages deep. But I want it to right. read. I want every sentence to read like you have you do. You should read it slowly. If people read it slowly, the yeah, object yeah. is not to finish it quickly. I'm just always amazed at how much meaning sentences can have, you know, and the way they build up. One of the things you had me thinking about as I was reading this other Eden actually is Colum Tabin and the master, his novel about Henry yeah. James, which. What Tabine does with sentences in the master made me finally go back to Henry James because I mean seriously. Oh, oh seriously. I love Henry. And yeah, no, and I get I I and I respect it. I finally made it through the Bostonians because yeah. of the master. And you know, I'd done Washington Square and Daisy Miller and Turn. Like I did all of the stuff I was supposed to do in high school, and then I, you know, I did st other stuff in college, so I missed out on Princess, what's her name? That goes right. Yeah. No. I, I no, know my but, limits as a human being. I know and, my yeah. limits as a human being. And, you know, with James, it was because he started dictating his novels out loud. Yeah, I'd heard that and it shows. But and I so, mean, yeah. the Bostonians, I had a new understanding because of what Tabin does with very simple sentences. Right, you know, right. Oh, he's the master. A, oh. And, you know, here you are doing a similar simple sentences because it's right there. It's as you get the layers. Right. That's a, that's what it is. Right? It's layering and layering and layering and layering. <laughs> this leads us to revision because there's no way you can do what you do without spending a lot of time chipping away at the chaff. You know, I've been teach I teach writing, been teaching it for a long time, fiction writing. And um, I have just like in the last couple of years, just come to realize that it is my personal opinion, in my humble opinion, um, that what we call revision is writing. It's almost a misnomer. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, because what I spend, you know, I've been working on this thing for like 10 years. Yeah. I have spent, you know, just, just when people say, how many drafts did you do? I'm like, well, I'd probably do a hundred drafts of every sentence. I'm just, one of the things I continually do is like every six or eight weeks, I print up a hard copy of whatever, wherever the yeah. manuscript is. And yeah. I just read the book. 
Okay. And so, you know, and it's always like a feedback loop. I'm always, fit, you know, blue inking it and then feeding it back in. But it's just iterative. I just keep going and keep going and keep going. And so I'll get so I can read through the first 25 pages without touching it. Mm-hmm. And then, the, then I start tweaking again, you know, and the next time maybe I can get through 35 pages and you're always just, mm-hmm. and the deeper you go, you know, if you get to page 150, you go back to page one and you realize stuff about page one. Right. That you didn't know about until you got to, you know, so it's this continually, you know, it's, it's feeding back on itself. I don't know if people think about this now, but you know, my generation or whatever, it was always like, I'm a, when have you revised too much? I'm afraid I'm I, like, I went past the ideal point and then it's, I'm re- over revising. I, the way I think of revision is precision of expression. And I think, you know, if, and I'm very platonic about, you know, like there's a, there's a perfect version of, you know, this other Eden somewhere out there and I got to get this close. To, and so I just think like, you can't over revise if you're just trying to make things clear. And precise. Okay, so this is interesting to me because you studied with Marilyn Robinson. Mm-hmm. Who I quite really love her work as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. But she also, I think, has said she doesn't revise, and I'm wondering if that is goes back to what you were just saying about how revision is essentially writing, and that you are just doing the work. So I think there's, you know, a couple of things. One is just that I think she doesn't rewrite, but it's, it's how she composes. Right. Okay. Like I just compose right on the page and throw it all in and it's a yes. mess and it's like I'm a magpie and I go, ooh, look, shiny. And I just throw it in <laughs> and just I'm collaging and weaving and I'm doing and, you know, put the blowtorch in and then melt it back to, you know, whatever. Cause that's just what I do. Like it's like, it's almost like productive inefficiency. I just try everything, you know, because I'm always listening for like, oh, I've never heard that note struck before or that key or that color or that juxtaposition. That's kind of, so it's just riffing. It's almost like, you know, just trying to, you know, to come up with jamming, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I think what she does is she composes in her head. I think, you know, she takes walks or something, that sort of thing. But it's true. I mean, this is one of the perils of teaching and writing learning, which is, I mean, the very first class I ever took in creative writing was with her. She walked into the room within 10 minutes. I was like, that's the life of the mind I want for myself. And, but then when I've had, you know, she's like, I just start on page one and I just, and if I get a hundred pages in and it's not right, I just throw it out and I start again. And if I thought that's how you had to write a novel, I would, you know, I'd be a plumber, <laughs> you, you, you know, okay. and you just realize that kind of like it, whatever it takes for you to get it on the page. Right. Like there's no way that a real writer would do something. There are only ways that you can get to real writing. I think, you know, each, each individual author. Tinkers came out in 09, right? Yeah, yeah. You win the Pulitzer in 10. Anon comes out in 13? 13, yeah. Okay, so, and Tinker's sort of had this notoriously rejection-filled life until Bellevue Literary Press found it, and everything went as it should in that beautiful jacket, and, and lots of people yelling oh, and God, kicking yeah. and screaming, and all of the right things happened at all of the right times. But did you write Anon faster than you wrote Tinker's? I mean, because I all I, did, I, you know, I was working on it before, so... Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I had the deal for Enon before Tinker's won the prize. Okay, so I was already kind of futzing around with it a little bit. Um, yeah, and I and like I think mentioned earlier, you know, Enon's a, kind of a monologue. Yeah, it's a different. So it is a different book from these two by far. Yeah. Yeah. So this, I mean, I think it has the same DNA and the mm-hmm. landscape and everything, yeah. and you know, but because it's a monologue, it was just kind of easier to write. You know, like yeah. Charlie saying "wah," you know, like I. That book was just, I had friends who had lost only, right. who had lost children. Right. And I was just like, that's the, the, when I, the minute I became a father, mm-hmm. I realized there's something that could happen now that I would just go out in the backyard, dig a hole and get in and just cover myself over. And these people not only had not done that, but, you know, I, you know, it was, it was just, it was kind of unfathomable to me. So I just, you know, just wrote that. So I think that was, a, it felt a little bit more straightforward. Because it's been nine years, well, almost 10, actually. I mean, if we, we're sitting in that slipstream of new year and it's just like, what year are we talking about? What are those numbers? Again? Yeah, yeah. But how long did it really take 10 years for the new book? I would say, yeah. I mean, and there, there were probably a couple of years where I, I didn't get as much done as I wanted to, partly because you know, I was moving, I got a job and raising kids and that sort of thing. You know, you know, it's that weird silver lining. You know, if you're you know, not really mystically inclined, well, maybe a little bit, but you know, the, dude, just, you're a New Englander. It's part of the baseline setting. Sorry. Yeah, and you know, like like Tinkers, I couldn't get published to save my life, so I worked on Tinkers for ten years. And that impatience and that, like, oh, I just want to get this thing published. 
But during all that time, I couldn't get it published. I would still work on it, you know? And so this, even though I, like I've, I think I've learned now that there's a certain, just there's a pace and there's that kind of like, you know, as Goethe said, as we all know, you know, right without cease and without haste. And I just like that. Like, it's just, it's a big cauldron on the back burner set it and it just bubbles, you know, and just let it interact, you know, and let them sift through each other. And, you know, finding out how these characters interact with one another and how they interact with the island. And how, it's like getting to know real people. It takes right. a long time. And I, so I, if you're lucky enough, you know, that book, when that book comes out, it's going to have your name on it and it's going to be in the world forever. If it takes an extra year or two to get it just right, that's going to seem like nothing in the, you know, in, in the fullness of time. Um, and plus, I just get to the point too, where I just like I feel like I, I miss the characters now. <laughs> I just mm-hmm. think, can I go back to can I go back to the island and talk to them again? You know that sort of thing. I think maybe if there if I had more time to just re- devote exclusively to writing rather than mm-hmm. you know teaching and work, you know work, it might have been a year quicker. But but it's still essentially what I'm hearing is it takes what it takes. It takes yeah, as much yeah, time it, as it, it takes, it, and it shakes out, and you get the thing when you get the thing. Yeah, and there's just a lot of writing in this in this that that I I just for there were long periods where it's like I have an intuition that all of this comes together. You know, it's like a stand of aspen trees. I know there's a root system. It's one organism, but I don't know like the connections are submerged, and so you just had to yeah you know, and you test something and you you know I spent a lot of time permutating and kind of collaging and moving stuff around, and t- until you know things sort of start to really click with one and fit and and call back and forth to one another through the book, you know, and I, I said, you know, the millions of mixed synesthetic, you know, metaphors right, that I have right. for writing, you know, I, one of them is just, I like the idea the, the, again, the ideal of you could like grab pin, you know, take any sentence in, you know, between your thumb, your forefinger and your thumb mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. pull on it. And it would tug on every other sentence in the, in the book. You know, that everything is totally connected organically. Yeah, no, I get that. I do get that. But was there anything that you had to jettison? I feel like you had the thing early on and it sort of revealed itself that there wasn't, you know, sometimes you're reading a very tightly written book and you're like, what's missing? What what got yanked out because it sat in a strange way? And I sort of feel like there wasn't anything like that here. It's funny because one of the really kind of cool, again, this is just like half the thing of it is just discovering these things. Yeah, yeah. Like, Ooh, this is going to be really fun to try. It's going to be yeah, hard. Yeah. I call it the Queen Lear phenomenon, Okay, which is like nobody reads King Lear and says, where's Queen Lear? Those girls needed a mother figure. You know what I right, mean? Right, right, because right. that's not the story yep. Shakespeare is telling. And yeah. so there are things in this other Eden that I just don't, that I just, they're just not part of my story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, because, you know, that could be somebody else's story, but, you know, uh, and it's a risk to take because there's always people say, oh, well, that wasn't in the story. And that would have made, you know, people tell you that like you could have written a different book better, you know, that kind of weird thing. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Mm. But it's that idea to, I say, oh, it's like Mo- Moby Dick, right? Like right. Moby Dick, nobody ever notices or objects to if they do notice that it's written in first person omniscient so part of it is there are elisions you know there, I, I think of ellipses i'm sort of like look i'm not i don't want to then she got up and walked over and picked up the cl-, you know that kind of thing so i feel like what i want is there's this world and i want to touch down at just the right places at just the right yeah. times and that's part of just presuming the intelligence of the reader and knowing that Good, you know, good readers are, you know, first of all, people always make connections. So you can leave spaces. And if you leave them, you know, if you make the spaces mm-hmm. in the right place and, you know, the reader will sort of just make a lot of connections on her own. Um, yep. And um, and so, you know, I like the idea, too, of just writing. It's like sentence by sentence, keeping the reader just like giving the reader stuff that the reader is going to just love to see. You know, I, mm-hmm. I you know, that's my test is like if I go, oh, that's cool. The reader who's coming behind me, it, like I write it, so it's not like I'm telling them anything. It's like I'm my writing is reproducing my experience of revelation and discovery right. that the reader then gets to go. Through. And I feel like if the reader, if every sentence gives them something to be just like, oh, cool, or that's beautiful, or that works, or that you know, then the other stuff, you know, that's the prerogative of art. It's poet. That's poetic license in a way. That it all hangs. It yeah, all hangs. yeah, yeah, absolutely hangs. Marilyn Robinson, an obvious influence, you know, Melville, Faulkner, 
Dickinson. Who else is in the personal pantheon? Oh Paul gosh, Harding. I mean, it's just there's there's so many there's so many. Um, I guess it's Sarah Orange Jewett for this one. Yep. She's kind of one of the patrons. You know, yep. the old tech Moses. I was mm-hmm. doing some interview and somebody said, "Who's your Who's your favorite?" And I think I said, "Who's your favorite?" I, said, I think it might be Moses. Just this moment, yeah. Shakespeare certainly. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, that, yeah, there's a lot of the Tempest. <laughs> There's oh, there's a lot of and this. The there's title, some tempest running through this. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, and that's and and that's what I started to think. You know, there's that storm at the beginning. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's like Noah's Ark. It's like the tempest. There's the island, the tempest. There's all these layers, you know, and even the way that um, this isn't a spoiler, you know, but even the way that the kind of the the waters rise and and recede, and there's a image, a prominent image of a big tree. It's I thought of it as the um, the Pequod at the end of Moby Dick rising back up out of the water, unsinking. And it's just it's supposed to be fun. You know, I mean, like, yeah, how many layers can you get? You know, and you do you get that kind of like you just end up being influenced by whoever you're teaching, right. whoever you're, you know, I was looking at um, Claudia Rankine's book, Citizen with a bunch of oh, students. Yeah. This like, it's so subtle and it's so powerful. And I think, oh, I think we were looking at the part that's about Serena Williams because Serena yep. retired, right? Yep. And that part of that book is just it. You you could read it, and all, it's so fine. It's almost like, and this is what I think about too. It's like, don't read it too quickly. You know, slow down. And with her, the more you slow down, the more it just it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and more and more resonant. And it's almost like the outrage of what she's writing about is finally, like, just literally, you know, bowel splittingly powerful because mm-hmm. she. Her voice is as quiet and as calm and just precise. And, you know, so that kind of artfulness, you know, just that's one of those ones that like every time I reread mm-hmm. it, I'm just like, I forgot that was in there. You know, like there's so much mm-hmm. that that super abundance, like it gives yeah. you something. Reading books is the only art form that I can think of where people are just like, I, they do it once and that's it. Like, yeah, I read that book. But who oh, says that yeah, about their favorite no, album? I, like, oh, my re-read. favorite album. I listened to my favorite album once. I saw my favorite mm-hmm. movie once. So I looked mm-hmm. at my favorite book. I, so I do, but I deliberately try to write these books so that every time, if you want, you can go mm-hmm. right back at the beginning. And like on second reading, you'll see all sorts of stuff in the beginning of the book that you, you couldn't see in the, in the, at the beginning. Without a doubt. I used to reread um, Moby Dick every year. Every, Absolutely. Sum, every summer I used to sit down with that beast of a book. Um, and I haven't done it recently for, you know, various and sundry reasons, but right. <laughs> mostly when you're producing this much original audio every week, <laughs> that, that, you yeah. know, Ahab can hang out. Uh, like, yeah, yeah. Guys are good. Other people can spend, you know, as much yep. time as they would like with. Yep. with but the, that's, you know, and I do that. I, you know, like Moby Dick is, you know, the, since yep. the example at hand. I know it so well. I just read in it. I just open yeah, it. Yeah. And, no, I, and after years now of teaching the Old Testament and teaching Shakespeare, I go back and I see and I read Moby Dick and it literally freaks me out because there's not a page in that entire book that is not utterly, totally, explicitly referring to the Old Testament and Shakespeare in this kind of telescopic way. Right. And that's how I thought of this book is, you know, you reading this book is me reading Marilyn Robinson, reading Faulkner, reading Melville, reading Shakespeare, reading Moses, reading, you know, just that kind of deliberately, just clearly and explicitly uh, um, luxuriating in influence. Luxuriating in influence. And also it is very much a piece of the American tradition. Like if you just look at, there is, there's an absolute through line for all of that. And yes, I realize I'm talking about Shakespeare as part of the American tradition, but if you look at early American literature, like you can't, the, it, it, it doesn't uh, exist without the bard. Like it just doesn't, and and now, you know, we take we keep pushing literature forward and we keep pushing story forward and we keep bringing more voices into it. You know, the American tradition widens. It gets bigger and more, deeper, you know, and all it, it's great. But to see this constant build and mm-hmm. when I say constant build, it's like any book. Right. Layering on whatever came before yeah. it is kind yeah. of great and, and that's the idea of be, like being original being influent you know the idea that you know like shakespeare i don't think he made up any of his plays mm-hmm. he just did way better versions of stories that already existed it's received traditions of in retelling the flood you know yeah. noah's you know and, and placing what happened on this island you know f- placing it in a fictional world the imaginative imagined world and then putting it as you know it's part of the spine this quintessential 
sort of spine of American experience and literature and history. Because um, I think that's the other thing, too, is you get all this stuff about they're marginalized. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. You know, if I'm on the island, you're my marginalized people. And I don't, I want you to stay in the margins, you know, or like the mainland. It's like where I live is the mainland, you know, that just even the shifts in the, you know, that kind of thing. It's, yeah, the island community, they're not the outsiders. No. They're, they're not the outsiders. And and that shift, that was one of the great pleasures of this book for me, where we were just firmly in the community. And, you know, I'm I'm sure Matthew Diamond didn't really think of himself as an outsider. And certainly some other folks who come rolling through the island as well yeah. do not think of themselves as outsiders in any way. Yeah, you can and, hear them saying, is this real peasant food? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> no, without without a doubt, without a doubt. And um, yet here's this community and they are amazing. This is, this other evening well, is a yeah. wonder of a book. It is amazing, well, this book. Thank you. It's always just like humbling and so like, oh my God, I'm so glad you, you know, like it, it, it worked, it's really it sort of worked. Book. But that's what I, from the very beginning, that's one of the things I knew that was, again, it would be difficult, but it'd be really cool if it worked, which is when you're in, when you're on the island, the language has a certain yeah. quality to it. And anytime, and the, but the book is, consists of all sorts of different texts and other sorts of idioms and genres. And the language does very specific things, degrades or shifts in certain very, very specific ways every time you leave the point of view of the island itself or the characters on it. And I just really wanted that. Melville's writing about these poor, these poor swabbies, right? You know, and Faulkner is writing about the dirt farm, you know, that the these people whose lives and what they do is they give them the language of mm -hmm. princes and king, you know, the most beautiful language, you know, the most beautiful things that English can do. That's what those authors get. And that in itself is evaluative. It places value, you know, just implicitly the Marilyn Robinson always used to say that the quality of attention that you devote to something is value like that gives it value. The time that you take to get something just right. You know, so even just getting these imagined lives exactly right every single sentence, you know, like that just in, like cumulatively ends up kind of giving this kind of, you know, this kind of value and privilege, as it were. We tell stories about the things we value. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. You know, and this, they may not turn out the way we think they turn out, or we may think we're saying something about what we value. And in fact, we are not saying that. I mean, <laughs> but ultimately, yeah. you tell stories about the things you value. Yeah. Yeah. And the people you value and the places you value. And it is everything is about placing judgment. Absolutely. And also the, you know, the quality of language. Also, you're devoting that to your reader. Yeah. You're saying I, I value my reader. You know, I, I love ending, finishing, a reading a book and thinking, I feel privileged to have read that. I feel dignified. I feel like that book was sort of thought of me as sacred or some, you know, whatever the word, you know, but just like, like it, that was a, it was a, a soul to soul. It was it was courteous to me, and it it it, it pre preserved my dignity or whatever, you know. And that's what I always want to think about. With just like I I want to write the kind of books that I most love to read. Wait, so what's next? Oh, gee, that's all. I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you know, I had to ask. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, the musician, you know, like, we want to play the new stuff, man. Um, I don't know. I have no okay. idea. I mean, to me, it's and I'm not. I have yeah. No idea. It's just because I just sit around and I just sit like in piles and piles of books and, I'm, you know, a big record collection. And I look through art books right now. I'm, re I'm looking at the paintings of Edel Adnan, who's an incredible mm -hmm. painter. He's very, they're very simple looking like landscapes. And she's from Lebanon. So she does a lot of it in the desert in California. You know, and that's what I do. Just, just do it. Just full immersion in all kinds of art and, and, and you know, and history and philosophy mm -hmm. And just looking for that, you know, I think with each of the novels that I've done so far, that the, the, they're not heavily plotted. No, you know? I, I, I don't turn to you for plot, my friend. Sorry. Yeah, that no, is no, not, no, no. That is not the thing you. I come to you for. Nor should you. <laughs> right. It's just like, okay, this is going to happen. It's like, this is yeah. a speak. Yeah. And then, you know, and then, you know, but finding that, finding that. And then the, the people, you know, like. To me, it's good. Like it just means that I put literally everything I have into that book, and now it's going to take a little while for the, you know, to kind of start filling the tank back up a little bit. Um, I'd like to do some writing about Shakespeare though, because his plays. I teach a cycle of his last 
five plays, you know, okay. that he wrote in very close succession mm -hmm. toward the end. And they're remarkable. They're, I mean, just, they're like a stand of aspen trees, you know, the way that yeah, yeah. kind of Lear and Macbeth are two halves of Hamlet mm -hmm. in some ways. Yeah, you know, yeah, and, I can and see that. Just, you know, and measure for measure is almost a weird, like dry run for the Tempest. He kind of gets the, you know, yep. anyways, whatever. But like, you know, just, I would like to write about some of that. There's it's, clearly something cooking there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another thing. I just feel like with Shakespeare, I'm like, Shakespeare, you don't need a professional to read Shakespeare because yeah. Shakespeare, line for line, every line Shakespeare writes means what it says and says what it means. Right. The character may not mean what he says and says it, but that's different. That's going on inside the play. Like right. Shakespeare's writing is actually very clear, and especially in those late tragedies, you know. So they're accessible. He was a mensch, you know. <laughs> I think, you know. Uh, I think you're right. I think you're right. But then again, I wasn't there. It's okay. I'm going to trust people to tell me something in a book. Yeah, exactly. You know, right. I, I, you know, someone else can tell me. And I knew this was going to happen, but you know what? <laughs> We've run through the entire hour. <laughs> we barely, we barely. I know started. we barely started. Paul Harding, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you for this conversation. Book. This other Eden is out now. Tinkers, if you haven't read it, remember it won the Pulitzer Prize in 2010. Go get it now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR top off. We've got a couple of great books to recommend today. When you stop in for your copy of This Other Eden. I'm Mark, and I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Jamie. Hello. Hi, Mark. I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Leewood, Kansas. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. I've got a really fun book to talk about that I um, try to push into people's hands pretty regularly, and that is the book Ella Minnow P by Mark Dunn. What a cute book. So I was thinking about this other Eden, and it reminded me a bit of this sort of equally charming, but also very chilling and sobering novel. It's set in a fictional island community uh, whose claim to fame is the birthplace of that pangram phrase, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, that phrase that uses every letter of the alphabet. That's why this town exists and why they're so darn famous. Not they're not really famous, don't worry. And the town has this, you know, big statue with a plaque that has this phrase in the center of the town. But letters begin to fall off of this plaque. And the council members in charge of this town decide that this is a sign and those letters cannot be used anymore in conversation, in writing these letters do not exist. And using them can create some punishments. So it makes for this really creative usage of language amongst the townsfolk. It's, the book is epistolary. It's all told in letters, mainly from the title character, Ella. And it starts off as this charming study of lexicon and develops into this fairly dark look at totalitarianism. and. As these letters begin to or continue to fall off of this plaque, people have to get a lot more creative with the words that they use, how they frame them, how they use them, and the consequences and punishments for using these letters become more and more severe. It takes a darker turn than I expected, but in a way that is absolutely earned. Um, I really love this book if you are a lover of language and are just wanting something a little different that takes this sort of utopian society and small isolated community to a place that you maybe haven't seen before, then by all means, check out Element OP by Mark Dunn. Jamie, what have you got for us? I'm going to talk today about Take My Hand, uh, which is a book that came out last year uh, by Dolan uh, Perkins Valdez. As I was reading this other Eden and I was reading about the story on, on the fictional Apple Island, you know, it's it's based on a real island, uh, Malaga Island in, in Maine. And uh, that was the results of that, the devastating results of the eugenics movement and how it played out in that story reminded me of Take My Hand. Um, this is a very thoroughly researched historical fiction. Um, and I just want to point out it's 1973. So <laughs> 1973 is historical now, which means I'm historical. <laughs> Uh, but this one is about Sybil Townsend, uh, and she is a nurse 
and later uh, becomes an OBGYN in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, it's a straightforward story, but it is told um, from both the young civil point of view and her as a much older adult doctor. This is a book club favorite uh, from customers in my store uh, because it really it illuminates a dark time in our too recent history. And like all great book club picks, it's going to encourage a whole lot of discussion because it, it deals with issues that are still unresolved today in some ways. Um, so the story is it follows this recently graduated nurse, civil to this clinic in Alabama, and she finds two very young sisters who are being given birth control dr drugs. These girls are ages 11 and 13, and they're being given these because they're poor and they're Black. Uh, and like this other Eden, it takes its story from really horrifying real life events. Um, and so there was a practice at that time, uh, which is sometimes referred to as a as a Mississippi appendectomy. Um, and this is just a horrible thing that happened. Um, it was a movement to sterilize African-American women while performing other surgeries without their consent or their knowledge. Some hospitals even allowed, um, teaching hospitals allowed students to practice hysterectomies, uh, medically unnecessary hysterectomies on African-American women. Um, who were being treated for other things. Uh, and so all of that sort of in part inspired this story. Uh, in this book, Sybil gets to know this family really personally and really well. She comes to love these 12 and 14 year old girls who fall victim to this practice, this sterilization practice, um, when their government decides they're unfit to be mothers. This novel is also just set a year or so after the revelations of the experiments on Black men at Tuskegee. And so for these characters, that's still a really, a very raw wound, and it adds an element of heartbreak to that story. Um, I'm also going to cheat, Mark, and I'm going to add a bonus nonfiction <laughs> recommendation, uh, because there's a good read-along. If you're interested in learning more on this topic, because there's so much more to it, uh, you can read a book that came out many years ago by Dorothy Roberts called Killing the Black Body, uh, Race, Reproduction, and mm. the Meaning of Liberty. Fantastic. I I love that you threw an extra bit in there. Um, there are topics in this book that I think just lead to more and more discussion and more and more thoughts, which is exactly what it should be doing. Um, so thank you. Nice picks as always. That is all we have for today, though. Thanks so much for tuning in to Port Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Jamie. You can follow my home store at BN Leewood KS. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading and enjoy the day. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.